me know when I'm live. Come, Holy Spirit, we need you. Come, sweet spirit, we pray. Come, sweet spirit, we pray. Come, oh Lord. Come in your strength and your power. Come in your own special way. in the beginning was the word the word was a God and the word was God you created everything there's nothing else that is made that was not made by him father this day we ask for the highest manifestation of your presence as we begin to declare the word into the soul of our nation save Nigeria change Nigeria make Nigeria great in our lifetime in Jesus mighty name we pray and the people said, Amen. You may be seated in his presence. Fellow citizens of Nigeria and friends of our nation, members of the press, both local and international, I welcome you to our first State of the Nation broadcast since the current administration assumed office on May 29, 2023. The theme of today's broadcast is Vice, Virtue, and Time. The three things that never stand still. Vice, Virtue, and Time. The three things that never stand still. This theme draws inspiration from both the sacred scripture and the words of two Englishmen, a cleric, Charles Caleb Colton, and a historian and politician, Edward Gibbon. In Revelation chapter 22, verses 11 and 12, we read the admonition of Jesus. It says, and I quote, He who is just, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, and let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. Verse number 12. And behold, I am coming quickly. And my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. As though echoing the words of Christ, Charles Caleb Colton wrote, He that is good will infallibly become better, <laughs> and he that is bad will as certainly become worse. For vice, virtue, and time are three things that never stand still. On his part, Edward Gibbon wrote, All that is human must retrograde if it does not advance. Fellow Nigerians, time is far spent on our journey to nationhood, and it's abundantly clear that instead of advancing forcefully in the right direction, we are regressing forcefully in a frantic race to the bottom. There's simply no middle ground. Please lend me your ears as I, by God's grace, show the way out of our present national dilemma. I would like to begin this address by identifying with my fellow Nigerian citizens who are often unceremoniously described as ordinary Nigerians or average Nigerian. I salute the Nigerian citizen who has for so long a time borne the brunt of the capricious policies of political actors and the greed of a colluding elite from a wrongly implemented Naira redesign policy to an impulsive fuel subsidy removal announcement and from a drowning of purchasing power in an attempt to flood the Naira to an unbearable increase in the cost of basic amenities. The past and recent months have been particularly excruciating for the Nigerian citizen. I'm talking about employees who have been forced to trek owing to the unaffordable spike 
in transportation costs. Parents struggling to bridge the gap between their life savings and the cost of living. Graduates whose chances of getting a job have become slimmer due to the impact of the economy on the labor market. I'm talking about that trader whose meager daily income has further diminished in value due to the dwindling value of the Naira. That farmer who looks on in agony as his produce rots on the farm due to transportation challenges, inflation, and insecurity. Those children who will invariably be sent home in September due to outstanding fees. I acknowledge you, fellow citizens of our nation, because you are the true heroes. The rulers that are, they are immune to the pain that you have to go through daily, and they are not true reformers. You, the Nigerian citizens, who have borne the burden of an ill-planned and vaguely led reform agenda, are the true reformers. You are the true reformers because of your adaptability. You are the true reformers because of the creative ways by which you are just to hardship. You reform your personal and corporate economies and navigate the increasingly difficult terrain. You, the so-called ordinary Nigerians, are the true reformers because somehow, hoping against hope, you show up every single day in what will appear to be a federal republic of diminishing returns. Therefore, my fellow Nigerian citizens, I may bold to say that there's nothing average about you, there's nothing ordinary about you, there's indeed nothing common about you. You are distinguished citizens of our nation, and you deserve the best of the land. The purpose of government is not to serve cronies. It's not to pander to corrupt business interests. It's not to patronize a consumptive political class. It's not even to appease neo-colonial foreign powers. The purpose of government is to serve you, the Nigerian citizen. Therefore, the focus of this address is just simply how to ensure that the government serves you. Oh. Let me say up front that I'm not unmindful that this address will be taken out of context by political propagandists within and outside of government. I'm not unaware that my motivations will be questioned and my intentions maligned. It's expected that the minions and mudslingers in the corridors of power will pick a fight because they will misconstrue this as an attack on their paymasters. Some may come against me with threats because they will see this address as an onslaught on the enterprises that they have built at the expense of the Nigerian people. My preemptive response to this attack dog is simple. Bring it on. If there are any wise ones among those surrounding the president, if there are wise ones among the institutions of law and order, if there are wise ones among the members of the National Assembly, among the power blocks that are sympathetic to the president, among the will-be cabinet members, or even among the stakeholders of the all-progressive Congress, such wise ones would listen attentively and take this address as a wake-up call, laden with truths that could salvage a ship drifting in the gale of a social, economic, and political Euroclider. However, if those around the president choose to be reactionary rather than responsive, their anticipated attacks on my person will be shrugged off like water off a dog's back. In the words of Charles Caleb Colton, nothing more completely baffles one who is full of trick and duplicity himself than straightforward and simple integrity in another. Besides, in the words of Apostle Paul, 
None of these things move me. What moves me is the needless suffering that is normalized and perpetuated by bad governance and irresponsible public policy. This brings me to a very worrisome issue, that of leadership by impulse. Amid the turbulent start to the administration of Ashwa Jubala Ahmed Tinumbu, I've held my peace, hoping that wisdom will prevail even while the government was in its so-called honeymoon phase. When in his inauguration address on May 29, 2023, President Tinumbu announced that sub fuel subsidy is gone, despite the cautious exclusion of that contentious speech by his advisors, it was clear that our nation had been unwittingly plunged into chaos by a very poor change management process. Whatever the president's true motivations were, it is clear that he put the car before the horse. What's also clear is that the president was economical with the truth by giving Nigerians the impression that he was taking a courageous move or step to remove the first subsidy when the previous government had already taken that step. As Nigerians will later learn, subsidy payment had already been ended by the Buhari administration and no subsidy was paid in 2023, even though there was provision for it on paper up to June 2023. What is again clear is that in line with change management principles, the president should have handled more circumspectly the announcement of such an issue that borders on the livelihood of the Nigerian citizen. That would have spared Nigerians the reactionary scarcity and price hikes that immediately followed his announcement. Furthermore, what is even clearer is that the president had been handed a month of grace by the previous administration, a month that should have been used to put in place cushioning effects before the official expiration of the subsidized economy. It is noteworthy that in his address to the nation on July 31, 2023, President Tinumbu adjusted his tone and admitted that the past administration had indeed taken action on subsidy as there was no budgetary allocation for aid from the end of June. It's also noteworthy that he admitted that there was a gap between the removal of the subsidy and the rollout of palliatives. While I commend the president for coming clean on this issue, it is in the best interest of the nation for Mr. President next time to consider intended and unintended consequences before committing to a course of action. Thank you. Let us now consider the cost of just one impulsive action to Nigerians in the past few months. Even as the president in his July 31 address celebrated the one trillion naira reportedly saved from subsidy or from subsidy remover, what he did not tell Nigerians is the cost of his approach to the Nigerian economy. According to the Nigerian Association of Small and Medium Enterprises, about 4 million micro, small, and medium enterprises in the country have shut down in the two months since the subsidy removal was announced. This is even as jobs have been lost and households have been thrown into disarray due to a poorly managed policy. This same impulsive leadership style was clearly evident when the president recently led the economic community of West African states ECOWAS to violate an ancient principle of diplomacy that is recognized even in the holy book that you must offer peace before declaring war. By placing military invasion on the table from the very start before subsequently exploring diplomatic options with the coup plotters in the Republic of Niger, President Tinumbu once again put the car before the horse, thus placing Nigeria and the subregion in a precarious situation. Truly, those that are loudest in their threats are weakest in the execution of them. 
for any foreign invasion to succeed in the long term, the support of the locals is essential. From the spillover effect of subsidy removal to the effect of sanctions, local support for Nigeria and our leaders among Nigerians is at an all-time low. It is therefore counterintuitive to engage in what could be a protracted conflict. This month, the Tinumbu led ECOWAS ought to have learned from the aftermath of America's invasion of Iraq in 2003. While we condemn the spate of coup d'etats in West Africa, we recognize that the situation calls for deep introspection on the part of African leaders and makes even more urgent the case for good governance. The call upon Nigeria at this time is not to so much to compel submission in the subregion through the force of might, but to command alignment through exemplary governance. The real question is whether President Tinumbu is capable of providing such moral leadership even in the domestic context. Fellow Nigerians, what is further clear concerning our domestic challenges is that by imposing hardships on Nigerians, without going after those corrupt individuals, corporations, and government officials who have plundered Nigeria over the years in the name of subsidy, the president has picked the wrong fight. In his Monday, July 31, 2023, address to the nation, the president stated that the vast sum of money which would have been better spent on public transportation, healthcare, schools, housing, and even national security was being funneled into the deep pockets and lavish bank accounts of a select group of individuals. The president further stated that the subsidy removal policy was to stop the squandering of monies on smugglers and frosters. This compels us to ask the following salient questions. Number one, who are these select groups of individuals into whose deep pockets are national Treasury has been funneled. Number two, who are these smugglers and fraudsters that have been defrauding our nation in the name of subsidy? Number three, who are these nameless characters that have fed fat at the expense of the poor? Mr. President, are they your business partners or are they all sacred cows? <laughs> Mr. President, if you are truly on the side of the poor, if you are serious about the welfare of the people, if you truly want the poor to breathe, as you have once said, then kill corruption and not Nigerians. <laughs> Some media men had been calling on me and said, Pastor Bakari had not spoken since he went to Ojota about subsidy remover, now is keeping quiet. May God forgive you so that it does not severe your tongue from your mouth. Fellow citizens, the rallying cry by which the Save Nigeria group galvanized Nigerians in January 2012 at Ghanifa Park or Jota was kill corruption on Nigerians. This was our cry when we made it evident that our fight was not against the removal of the first subsidy, but against the corruption in the system. This was our fight when amid the threats to my life and family, right there at Ojota and live on national and international television, I called out by name those individual and corporate entities who had allegedly ravaged our nation. Mr. President, given the complexity of the Nigerian economy, we are not thoroughly convinced that your palliatives will be sufficient to cushion the effect of your policies on the Nigerian citizen. <laughs> what we do know, however, is that on May 29, 2023, you swore an oath to be faithful and bear true allegiance to the Federal Republic of Nigeria and to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. May I remind you, Mr. President, the chapter 2, section 14, subsection 2, subsection B of the Constitution states that the security and welfare of the people shall be the primary purpose of government. 
Therefore, in compliance with your oath of office and in accordance with the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, I will demand on you the current, and it's just current, the current occupant of the office of the president, our demand on you is the same demand that we made 11 years ago. Mr. President, kill corruption and non Nigerians. Some might say that you, Mr. President, are too tainted to fight corruption because you were escorted into the presidency by a retinue of corruption allegations. Some might even describe you as transparently, opaquely corrupt because despite the indicators of state capture allegedly linked to you, no one has proved these allegations against you in any court of competent jurisdiction. Some might argue that even the road you took to the president was itself paved with filth from the cesspool of corruption and that you are therefore incapable of mounting any genuine fight against corruption. Mr. President, while we admit that as of today, our nation has transitioned from an administration that came to power on the supposed winds of integrity and anti-corruption, as I told the former president in his residence, no one can today doubt that you are the president of the Federal Republic by the system that produced you with enormous powers to fight against corruption and its hydra-headed forms. Even if the allegations against you are valid, I challenge you today to humble yourself before God because you can still have a road to Damascus experience. And decide today to stand on the side of poverty and bring to book the vested interests that have built their wealth on the ruins of our nation. I keep on saying that every saint has a past and every sinner has a future. You can repent today and have a road, the road to Damascus experience. You can decide to take the burden of reforms of the Nigerian people and go after the corporations and individuals who have plundered our nation. You can decide today to stand with the poor and take the fight to the plunderers. Mr. President, even though you have announced some palliatives, let me remind you that palliatives cannot address the root cause of the problem. In my recent exchange with Dr. Joe Oke Odumaki, a veteran of many progressive battles who received bullets and was imprisoned several times, in my exchange with her, she brought the Oxford Learner's Dictionary definition of the word palliative to my attention. You want to know? It is a medicine or medical treatment that reduces pain without curing its cause. Therefore, we demand that you address the root cause of the problem. Take the yoke off the neck of the poor, go after the looters, recover the loot, and retool it to the benefit of Nigerians. In simple times, Mr. President, kill corruption, non-Nigerians. Some may ask at this juncture, who exactly are these plunderers that have been enabled over the years to launder our collective patrimony through a dubious subsidy regime how much can we actually recover from them? My fellow citizens, tighten your seat belts as I take you back to certain alarming events that occurred in our nation's recent history, events that have elicited lingering questions. I'm talking about a history of criminal impunity. Eleven years ago, on Friday, January 13, the fifth day, of an unprecedented gathering of Nigerians at Gafnifawemi Park, Ojota, the Save Nigeria Group, SNG, brought to the attention of Nigerians the outcomes of an external audit carried out by two audit firms, KPMG and SS Apemike and Co. These firms had been contacted 
by the federal, contracted by the Federal Ministry of Finance to audit the petroleum sector. Their investigations revealed that the fuel subsidy regime was a small screen for corruption. Among other findings, the audit exposed fraudulent deductions of up to six times higher than the authorized subsidy disbursements. It also revealed revenue leakages of about 800 billion from the upstream sector and 1.2 trillion from the downstream sector, which included the fraudulent subsidy system. The key agencies in the petroleum sector, including the Nigeria National Petroleum Corporation, were inducted. In addition, 80% of the questionable subsidy claims were traced to leading oil marketers, and we mentioned their name at Ojota back then, <laughs> oil marketers whose company names were listed in the report and whose major shareholders are known to the Corporate Affairs Commission, CAC, and the Securities and Exchange Commission, SEC. I saw some of them paying you homage in the villa. Following these findings, the Adel Committee on Foil Subsidy in the House of Representatives made explosive findings that were even more alarming and damning than the earlier audit reports. Permit me to restate some of these findings as they were cited in a publication by the Save Nigeria Group titled Kleptocracy Unlimited. You'll find that in my book also, Strategic Intervention in Governance, Volume 1. Number one, the theft of 310 billion by NMPC on kerosene subsidy in spite of an official policy against subsidy on the product. Government has said no subsidy on kerosene, but they still removed 310 billion and stole it. Number two, the theft by NMPC of 285 billion above the recommendation by the Petroleum Product Pricing and Regulatory Agency, PPPRA. Number three, the payment of 999 million, 128 times in 24 hours to some companies totaling 127. 0.872 billion by the Office of the Accountant General of the Federation. The Accountant General of the Federation Office is sick, past, present. We hope it will change in the future. On accounted number four for foreign exchange to the tune of $402.6 million. Number five, the theft of $230 billion forensically traced to 72 companies. Given these and other alarming findings, the committee recommended the refund of 1 trillion, 67 billion, 40 million, 456,171 naira, 31 kobo, to the National Treasury by the NNPC, the PPRA, the indicted marketers. Furthermore, 18 companies have failed to appear before the committee were recommended to the anti corruption agencies for investigation to ensure the refund of 41 billion, 936 million, 140,005 naira at one combo. Unfortunately, rather than the anti-corruption agencies prosecuting the inductees and recovering looted funds, what happened next put an abrupt end to what Nigerians had thought was a semblance of property in the House of Representatives. As Nigerians may recall, the State Security Service, SSS, now called the Department of State Services, DSS, in collaboration with Mr. Femi Otedola, chairman of one of the major indicted companies, Zenon Petroleum and Gas Limited, masterminded a sting operation that allegedly exposed the corruptibility of the chairman of the House Committee, Farouk Lawan, thereby impugning the credibility of the committee and silencing these investigations. Even when a follow-up committee set up by President Goodlaw, Jonathan, and led by Mr. Aigboje Eigi Mokwede, indicted 21 companies to the tune of 382 billion, no concrete action was taken by the then government to do justice, prosecute offenders, and recover the funds that rightly belong to the Nigerian Treasury. Meanwhile, the subsidy regime was reinstated 
and Nigerians recover from the shock. Years later, in March 2017, under the administration of President Muhammadu Buhari, the House of Representatives instituted a fresh investigation into the opaque and secrecy shrouded petroleum subsidy regime from 2012 to May 2016, especially the activities of the NMPC and the marketers. This probe once again yielded no fruit. However, on June 29, 2022, the House of Representatives commissioned yet another investigation on subsidy payments on petroleum products, especially petrol, under the Buhari administration. The House also investigated the state of refineries and found that Nigeria has spent, are you ready, 11.35 trillion so far maintaining moribund refineries. This is even as subsidy allocations worth $2.1 billion and 3.1 trillion naira have been reported missing and unaccounted for between 2016 and 2019. I expect that President Tinumbu has been well briefed on these investigations that were conducted over the years, as well as the individuals, agencies, and corporate entities indicted. I sincerely hope that the president is poised to take the needed action, because whether he likes it or not, the honeymoon is over, and Nigerians are asking questions. Nigerians are not asking whether these alarming cases of corruption occurred during his administration or not. Nigerians are not exonerating him and blaming the past president who failed to do justice on these issues. Nigerians are not patiently waiting for President Tinumbu to get his act together through trial and error. Nigerians are asking why the poor have to suffer for the criminal activities of these individuals and companies that are well known. Even as the government attempts an economic reform agenda, we must realize as a nation that no economy can thrive on criminal impunity. There can be no successful economic reforms without economic justice. Economic justice includes placing the cost of reforms on those who cause the problems in the first place, rather than on the people. Without economic justice, the attempts to sanitize the sector, including the Petroleum Industry Act, the abrupt subsidy removal, the exchange rate harmonization policy, and the announcement of pallia palliatives will all amount to papering over the cracks of a broken down wall while the foundation is fast caving in. I have a question to ask all our agencies. Are they crime fighters or crime facilitators? Or how have these sudden transactions taken place over a decade under the watchful eyes of the Economic Financial Crimes Commission? How did these underhand dealings, which are clear threat to our national security, continue for over a decade right under the nose of the State Security Service or the Department of State Service, as they are now called? Why have these alarming reports come from probes carried out by legislature, the legislature and civil society organization alone and not from the security and law enforcement agencies? Why did the DSS work with vested interests just to discredit the probe of the House Committee in 2012, rather than investigate the individuals and organizations indicted and prosecute those found culpable as recommended by the committee. Recently, the actions of the DSS have raised concerns about professionalism and adherence to the rule of law. Instances such as reported invasion of the premises of the EFCC and the handling of the case of the suspended governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria, CBN, Mr. Godwin Emefiele, has sparked discussions regarding the need for due process and equitable application of justice. Considering the reported claims by the DSS 
that his actions were in line with an order from above, the handling of the Mephiela case has sent a signal to the world that the current president's disposition to the war against corruption is primarily motivated by a clampdown on perceived political adversaries while various other enemies of Nigeria remain untouched. <laughs> Mr. Godwin Emefiele may have made the wrong judgment calls in the management of Nigeria's monetary policy, but he must not be made a scapegoat by the provisions of the Central Bank of Nigeria CBN Act 2007 there's every possibility that the XY Central Bank governor did not act without presidential authorization. <laughs> if a mafia is found liable for any crime, by all means, it should be prosecuted. However, considering the dynamics of the pre-election environment and the then candidate Bola Tinumbu's public allegation that the Naira redesign policy was targeted at him, the optic of the president targeting a mafia left for prosecution after winning the election and being sworn in as president could be interpreted as a form of vendetta far beneath such a distinguished office. The same can be said of the detention of the suspended chairman of the EFCC, Mr. Abdurashid Bawa. Mr. Bawa was not only linked to the Naira redesign policy, he had also disclosed that the anti-graft agency will arrest and prosecute some outgoing governors after the expiration of their immunity on May 29, 2023. Today, Bawa is being held in detention by the DSS, while Belo Matawale, a former governor that Bawa had been investigating, has been nominated by the president as a minister. Once again, if Bawa is indicted in any criminal investigation, then the lawful thing to do is to prosecute him, to continue to hold him in detention. In these circumstances, raises significant concerns about the readiness of the Tinumbu administration to fight corruption. This undemocratic disposition questions the pro-democracy antecedents of the president and indicates the consolidation of authoritarian tendencies. I'm reminded of the warning that I sounded to Nigerians in January 2023 in my address titled Bridging the Gap Between Policies and Governance. I warned then that the policies of entitlement, the Emiloko type of politics, will breed an imperial presidency, one that will slide towards a dictatorship and will be intolerant of dissent. It is rather preposterous that the DSS has reduced itself to a pack of Napoleon's dogs let loose on perceived opponents of the president when in this same country, a militant like Asari Dokubo is openly breeding an armed militia in open support for the president, doing so with impunity and without as much as a slap on the wrist from the security agencies. Our security agencies cannot look the other way in the face of the brazen violation of the Constitution by non-state actors who declare allegiance to the president while being ever poised to clamp down on the rise of the perceived opponents of the powers that be. Let me remind those who constitutionally hold a monopoly on the use of force that they do so on behalf of the Nigerian people and not as agents of those in power. This reminder is especially pertinent as Nigerians become increasingly agitated due to the hardships imposed on them by the government. As citizen-led movements spring up in Nigeria, the democratic quotient of those in power will be tested. Such office holders must remember the warning that was sounded in December 2011, a few weeks before the protests in Ojota, let those relying on their ill-equipped, underpaid, underfair police officers and politi political thugs remember the words of President J. F. Kennedy, a society that cannot help the many who are poor cannot save the few that are rich. Undeniably, undeniably 
The state of our nation calls for courage. Somebody say courage. courage. The state of our nation calls for courage. However, as the story of Rehoboam, the fourth king of Israel, teaches us the kind of courage that adopts anti-people policies and oppresses the weak will only yield divisive outcomes. Therefore, Mr. President, use your courage to lessen the burdens of our citizens and not to further oppress them. Use your courage to unite the nation and not to vote for the dividers. Use your courage to address historical grievances and not to further deepen wounds. Do justice. Mount a genuine fight against corruption. Rise above vendetta. Foster reconciliation and give every Nigerian in the East, West, North and South a reason to believe in a united Nigeria. At this juncture, I must also send a warning to the ruling party, the APC. I was there when the APC was formed, and the extent of my involvement is well documented. As a stakeholder, and more importantly as a nation builder, I'm obligated to stay without equivoc equivocation that this is not the APC we envisaged. The results of the last elections were a clear indication that Nigerians are fed up with what the APC has become. According to the results released by ENEC, in the presidential elections, the APC had 15.4 million votes in 2015, 15.2 million votes in 2019, but by the 2023 elections, the AP support base had declined significantly to 8.8 .8 million with a loss of almost half of the traditional support base. If it were not for the divisions within the People's Democratic Party, PDP, and the emergence of the obedient movement of the Labour Party, LP, that split, that split the traditional support, support base of the PDP, the APC would have convincingly lost the 2023 elections. Even now, the party's victory as announced by the Independent National Electric, Electoral Commission, ENEC, is being challenged in court. When I consider the vision and founding spirit that brought the APC, I cannot but conclude that the APC is losing the plot. The APC party with clear motivations was established as a progressive to establish true nationhood, eliminate corruption, oversee governance structure reforms, eradicate poverty, and facilitate economic growth. However, like its predecessor, the PDP, the APC has now become a platform for politicians who have neither conviction nor ideology and who hope from party to party seeking power at all costs. The suffering meted out to the Nigerian people as a result of anti-people policies is not what the APC once stood for. The APC stood for progressivism and progressivism is characterized by substantial public investments in social sectors, such as education and healthcare. And it achieves inclusiveness and social mobility by deploying political power to provide an irreducible minimum standard of living for citizens. Progressivism prioritizes equity, justice, and inclusiveness in access to opportunities while it facilitates a private sector-led economy. Its economic growth policies are aimed at empowering the people by redistributing opportunities on the basis of fairness and equity. Progressivism is not built on trickle-down economics. Instead, it is grassroots-oriented, invests in local opportunities, and builds the economy from the bottom up. As progressivism eradicates currency arbitrage, it will not leave the currency to float that without a guarantee of domestic production, the cushioning effect of social investment, and a readiness to intervene when necessary to strengthen the local currency. As progressivism eliminates a corruption reading subsidy regime, it will not hesitate to boost or underwrite access to factors of production 
such as energy, infrastructure, and human resource in an atmosphere of transparency and accountability. A progressive approach to the subsidy conundrum would have been characterized by a phased removal of subsidy, buffered by transparent investments in local refining, capacity, and social welfare, while the corrupt individuals and corporations that have bled the nation are compelled to return their loots. Whereas progressivism cooperates with the international community, in compliance with international economic and trade law, it will not allow the economy to drift in the ocean of one-size-fits-all recommendations by neoliberal foreign interests. If the APC hopes to survive as a political party in a political landscape that is becoming highly competitive, it must revisit its foundations and reinvent itself into a new party that is an A, alternative, B, parallel, C, contrast to what the current party has become. While the president has tried to stabilize a rocking boat by announcing some interventions, let it be known that we cannot build a strong economy on reactionary and shifting policies. No destructive means will ever bring about a constructive end. The president and his team must return to the drawing board to drive a coordinated economic program based on the original progressive ideology of the APC. In addition, the president, through the security agencies, with the facilitation of the National Security Advisor, must lead a recovery-oriented war against corruption. The primary aim of such an anti-corruption war should be to revisit the cumulative allegations of fraudulent transactions worth trillions of naira, as I lay highlighted by the various committees that have investigated the subsidy regime between 2007 and 2023. Such an anti-corruption war She'll also expose those who have paralyzed our refineries over the years and turn our moribund refineries into cash cows. All monies confirmed to have been fraudulently received by corporate and individual actors in the subsidy regime, as well as the delusive turnaround maintenance of refineries should be returned to the Nigerian Treasury. Such monies should be deployed to further cushion the effects of subsidy removal on the poor. Revamp the local refineries, invest in alternative energy, finance infrastructure delivery in partnership with the private sector, and deliver good governance to the Nigerian people. They deserve aid. Finally, a government that is asking the poor to tighten their belts cannot afford a bloated waistline. A reduction in the size of government will ultimately translate to a reduction in the cost of governance. By nominating 48 ministers, the president is about to set a record for the highest number of ministers since 1999. This is not the kind of record expected of a supposed reform-minded government. In a world of cutting-edge nations, in which governance is becoming lean and agile, what does the president need 48 ministers or a cabinet of close to 70 persons for other than the distribution of patronage? It is hypocritical for a government that has subjected Nigerians to untold hardship by adopting neoliberal policy prescriptions to then turn around and expand the size of government thereby violating a core aspect of the same neoliberal principles. That, Mr. President, does not constitute genuine reforms. It is governance by political convenience. Truth be told, certain ministerial appointments and that of the current APC chairman by consensus illustrate the error that proceeds from the ruler as stated by the preacher in Ecclesiastes chapter 10 Five to seven. He reads, and I quote, There is an evil I have seen under the sun as an error proceeding from the ruler. Folly is set in great dignity 
while the rich sit in a lowly place, I've seen servants on horses while princes walk on the ground like servants. It does appear, Mr. President, that by your appointments, there's a reward for bad behavior and mediocrity in our polity. In conclusion, it was William E. Bora who once said, the marvel of all history is the patience with which men and women submit to burdens unnecessarily laid upon them by their governments. Once again, I salute you, my fellow Nigerian citizens, for your resourcefulness, for your steadfastness and doggedness amid the present difficulties. However, our resilience must not become docility. As we say in our local parlance, time is going. And if we fail to make progress in the direction of forward ever, we have automatically chosen backward ever. As citizens, we must continue to place a demand for good governance on our leaders, including our representatives, in the various legislative assemblies, including those who mock the poor. Our representatives must at this moment in the history of our nation take a stand for truth, for probity, for transparency, for accountability, and for justice. While events in our recent history do not give us sufficient confidence in the ability of the National Assembly to hold the executive to account, we as the electorate must remind the lawmakers that they represent us, not special interests, and that we hold the power of the vote, including the power of recall. Finally, I'm reminded that liberty will not descend to a people. A people must raise themselves to liberty. It is a blessing that must be earned before it can be enjoyed. I remain confident that Nigeria will overcome the present challenges and that there will be a new Nigeria, a Nigeria that works for every Nigeria in my lifetime. Thank you for listening. God bless you. And God bless the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Lift your hands to heaven. And let us begin to pray that this world will enter the right quarters. They will not replace excellence with mediocrity. In our nation, officials of the government will not have bad behaviors and be promoted on horses. In the name of Jesus, we need men who have capacity, who have character, who have competence. And if they will not yield, let the vision that we saw before come to pass. I see a young man with a kite. He was playing with the kite. He was going to high heavens. But he did not foresee the rain that would bring the kite down. The rain brought the kite down and it was beaten and it was soaked. And then a man standing on a hill was standing there laughing at him because he had an umbrella. He lifted the umbrella up and covered his body from the rain. And he said, we have the solution. He did not realize that a wild wind was coming that tore the umbrella into shreds. The umbrella was turned into shreds. He jumped down from the hill and ran into a hut. And the man with the kite also followed him. Inside the hut was a man with broom who was sweeping the water out, but they did not know that storm was coming that will uproot the foundation that was rickety and bring the entire house down on the man with the kite, the man with the umbrella, the man with the broom. They were swept up, and the fourth man showed up. The fourth man is not any known human being. The fourth man is the same fourth man in the fire. He's coming to lay a new foundation for a new Nigeria in the name of Jesus. He's taking away the old in order to establish the new. And when he steps into the terrain to begin to reign, you cannot stop him. I saw in that vision that he laid a new solid foundation and built on it a very amazing, magnificent building. And written on the building is the Federal Republic of the new Nigeria. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. We need you more than ever before. Sweep these men away. And those who cling to the old, let them vanish with the old. Establish the new in our land. In the mighty name of Jesus, we have declared what you have said to us. We have declared what we have seen. And we are asking, Father, Lord Jesus, come quickly.
He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. He that is holy, let him be holy still. Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is in my hand to give to every man as his work shall be. Somebody shout, come Lord Jesus. Amen. You are the governor among the nations. You give government to who you like. You can remove kings. You can put kings in position. In Nigeria, everyone that is not in alignment with your plan, with your purpose for the new Nigeria, Lord, have your way. Approve them and throw them away in the name of Jesus. Establish a new Nigeria with standards that are high. Give us men of character, of capacity, of competence. We are tired of dwarfs pretending to be giants. We are tired of political uh, 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 Democrats who just mount it and can't do it. Give us the righteous. We have grown long enough. Give righteous men to Nigeria. When wicked men are in authority, the people groan. But when righteous men arise, the people rejoice. The time of rejoicing is at hand. Nigeria is going to flourish again. In the name of Jesus, in my lifetime, in your lifetime, we will wake up one morning and they are all history. They are all gone. They are all swept away. In the name of Jesus, the little heart will be swept off. A new nation will be established upon the foundation of righteousness. And government will then begin to cater for the welfare and the security of our people. Lift up your hands and thank God for today's broadcast. Lord, we thank you for your word. It's gone forth. It will not return to you void. Do what pleases you in our day, in our time, in our nation. Let Nigeria flourish again. Let Nigeria flourish again. Let Nigeria flourish again in the mighty name of Jesus.